going to be talking about um, something a little bit away from the game of poker per se and more about looking at poker as an investment. The, the conceit here is that to some extent you're either a winning poker player now or eventually you'll get there. So this is looking at now that you have these, these alpha streams, like these streams of positive EV that you um, can pick which ones you want to embrace, how do you balance that? Like how do you look at your future given that this is now an option you, you hold? So cash game here just means anything that's not a tournament. Where a tournament is a, is a, it's a poker structure where you buy in and with money you receive tournament chips and you only get money to the extent that you um, survive uh, longer than someone else. Where the person with all the chips in the end wins some set piece, not necessarily all their chips. Um, whereas a cash game is uh, one such that each chip has a specific value. Like you are actually betting real dollars and you can enter or, or leave whenever you like. So in cash games, like chips are uh, effectively literal money. So the more chips you win, the more, you, the more money you win. Whereas in tournaments, all that matters is the position you finish. And when we talk about the independent chip model, we'll talk about when those diverge. Um, the second point is about that, where um, chip EV, like literally having more chips in a cash game, is directly related to the amount of money you make. Like if you're making a decision that results in you having more chips, you make more money in the long run. Whereas in a tournament, it's a little bit more complicated. They're congruent, and they generally trend in the same direction. But in some particular cases, um, what's something that's uh, positive chip EV may be either positive or negative in terms of dollar EV. And we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, so in cash games, you can come and go whenever you want. That makes them very liquid. If you're, if you're a big cash game player, you can generally grind out your hourly win rate um, whenever you want, especially online. There's a little bit of overhead when you play live, but cash games are much easier to just come and go. Um, with regard to kind of executing your, your skill. With tournaments, um, you have to, like, you get all your EV from winning, from lasting long. So you're generally stuck, the more, like, the better you are, the longer these tournaments take. And you have to kind of be there for the long run and, and generally plan to, to last a long time. Um, in cash games, you can buy in as many times as you want. Like as soon as you get, if you're in a cash game with a lot of bad players and you get knocked out, you can just buy back in, and it's like it never happened. Um, with a tournament, if you're in a tournament with a lot of bad players and you get knocked out the first hand because you get unlucky, you never get to redo that um, for most tournaments. Like you're, you always get kind of a new field of players, and you don't have the opportunity to re-enter a tournament. Your only choice is to enter it the first time or not. Um, cash games have fixed blinds. The situation that you're in when you start is generally the situation you're always going to be in. So you don't need to factor in um, having a different size stack. Presumably, you're always going to have like at least the maximum buy-in or more. Whereas in tournament situations, you're going to be short stacked. People at, at your table are going to have a widely different stack size. In cash games, you have this thing called table selection, which is you get to see the nine people that you're going to play against. And you can watch them, and you can see, all right, if Eight people call pre-flop in a cash game. You know that probably seven of those people are bad, and you can just enter that game and play against those uh, eight or nine people. Totally fine. Whereas for tournaments, because of the you're only playing against nine p other people in the tournament of a field of say like a hundred, you only really get to target groups of people. You can identify. Um, like an audience of people who would enter that tournament and then get an idea of what the average person you'll play against will be. But you can enter a tournament with 90 fish and 10 pros and be at a table of 10 pros to start. So that adds a little bit of variance. And it also adds um, some complexity in trying to get a read at your table um, and, and kind of make that jive with your read of what the, the average player should be for that tournament. Like the, the World Series of Poker is, is typically a tournament that has like 60% fish, 40% pro now, uh, pros nowadays. But a lot of tables end up like eight pros and two fish. And that creates um, a much different type of situation for you than if you were at a table that was primarily new players. Um, as I said before, cash games have higher liquidity. Like if you, like the best kind of career you can make in, po in poker is being really good at a cash game because you can go anywhere and play those. You can play as long as you want. Like if you only have two hours and, and you're in Vegas, you can grind out like pretty confidently, like $150 of EV, no problem. Whereas in a tournament, it's much more uncertain how long it'll take you to capture that EV um, and how long you might uh, be obligated to stick around. Cash games are typically for any, for what's considered normal win rates, cash games are considered lower variance. Um, and tournaments are considered higher variance. 
if you're winning at cash games, you're crushing it, but it's much, much harder to win at cash games, at, at least at like the medium high stakes. And it's for, it's for this reason. It's because anyone who's a loser at cash game uh, knows it immediately and drops out really quickly. Whereas in tournaments, like some of the big name pros are probably losers at this point. They just don't know it yet. Because you can go years before you find out whether you're actually a winner or a loser at big tournaments. Let's talk about the tournament life cycle. So the early game is going to be like everything before like the bubble. So it's going to be like the first 90% of eliminations in the tournament will be in the early game. <laughs> Although because of how tournaments work, that ends up being like half the tournament uh, in terms of time. But you get the idea. Anyway, so play during the early game is very similar to cash games. There's no, there's no ICM, like there's no difference in um, the value of chips early on because when you have a thousand chips and you need a hundred thousand to win the tournament, like a difference of 50 chips isn't that big of a deal. Like the, um, the difference in value of chips doesn't really matter that much, which is why I'm saying that chip EV, like tournament chip EV is approximately equal to like real dollar EV. So make decisions as if it were a normal cash game. Um, in addition, your, your playing style is going to be entirely influenced by your stack size. Like having the same um, proportional stack size later in the early game, you'll make the same types of decisions. Uh, I'm defining different zones of play based on your stack size. Um, if your M is less than two, I'm calling that the dead zone. Harrington called it that. Um, two to eight is the steal period. Eight to 12 is a steal re-steal period, and we'll explain what that is later. Um, 12 to 30 is a value betting zone, and then 30 or more is a set mining zone. Um, so le let me talk about tempo before we get into what exactly uh, those things are. So the, the, the most important thing about tournaments with regard to how it's different than a cash game is getting the, getting the speed right, like getting your aggression at the right level. So Doyle Brunson used to say that um, never get caught speeding in a tournament. And what that means is don't get caught being way too aggressive way too early on. And by early on, I mean when you have a big chip stack. Um, so you need to win coin flips. Like you will have to win several hands when you're behind to win a tournament. So what you should do is make sure that when you're not in coin flips, you slowly grow your stack and you avoid flipping when you don't have to so that when you actually do flip, you, you end up with more chips. Like those small difference are the things that are multiplied all throughout the tournament to make you instead of like 1% chance of winning a tournament, like three or four. Like that's where your, your edge really materializes. So the dead zone. So being in the dead zone is, is terrible. It's much worse than half of having four M. You should only ever be in the zone because you lost the last hand and you had slightly more chips than that guy because this is a really bad situation to be in because you have no fold equity. So fold equity is where your value is gonna come from because like you're not gonna win a lot of showdowns in a tournament and a lot of your chip, a lot of like your EV from the tournament is gonna come from fold equity. So if you have less than 2M, you're gonna bet like pre-flop and the big blind's gonna call you without even looking at his hand which means you have no fold equity. Like you are basically, you basically have to um, win a showdown to get back into it. And that's a really bad situation. You wanna get out of the dead zone before you have to pay a big blind and then you're gonna be stuck on whatever hand you get there. Um, and the reason is you wanna be able to get your fold equity back. Um, if you're under at 1M under any circumstance, so never, never do that. Like call any two cards before you get to 1M. Um, why? Because if you have one M and then you double up, you still are in the dead zone. Like you're basically, you're at least one coin flip uh, behind being in a terrible situation. So like enter any sort of coin flip to get, to avoid getting below one M. So a lot of your, a lot of your value is gonna come from this steal period. And by steal, I mean stealing blinds. Um, so when you have between two and eight M, your only decision is to go all in or fold. Because every time you steal the blinds and the blinds are really valuable to you, you increase your stack by like 20 or 30%. Like that's a big deal. That's probably more than your equity from actually uh, going to showdown. Yeah, like that's more, unless you literally have aces, that's probably better than any sort of edge you're gonna have by getting called. 
So find out who doesn't protect their blinds and steal from them. Like you sh should have been reading people early in the tournament to find out who's a pushover. Like they're gonna be your best friend because you're gonna steal blinds from them. On the, con like on the converse, like pretend like you're someone who defends their blind because if, if you get walked, if everyone folds to your big blind, you just get one additional M for free. But don't actually do it because you don't wanna see a showdown. It's a bit of a game of chicken and like I will, like actively pretend, like I will tell a person I will actively defend my blinds because it's not binding and you can do that. And then just like think about whatever hand I have and then fold. Like you, you should still be calling at a very tight range, but to the extent that you can uh, convince them not to push into you, um, it's almost as good as just stealing yourself. So avoid showdowns if at all possible. So a lot of your, a lot of your hands are gonna be played in this period and the most important thing you can do is find opportunities to steal. Don't get into showdowns, don't call unless you think you're like a 70% favorite. And it's related to the gap theory which is by Sklansky which says to call a hand you need a, to call an all in you need a much stronger hand than to push. Why? Because when you push, when you bet, you have fold equity and when you call you don't. And that's the difference, like you can, you can push with any two cards in a lot of situations, but you need to have a good hand to call. So your, your, your goal here is to keep your head above water. Don't fall below two, and preferably get into like, um, get into like the 10M period, um, either by doubling up or by stealing. Like, so if you steal three hands in a row, you have 11M if you're at eight. That's the idea here. And then once you're at 11M, you're in a much more interesting situation. So the steal resteal period is when everyone is trying to steal blinds, except you have the equity such that if you get re-raised, you can fold. So what will happen is people will bet into you and you have to repop them sometimes. And then sometimes, like you have to identify who's gonna repop you and avoid them. Um, so here's the idea. So if you um, steal a bet with like 2M and if he re-raises you with 6M, you're like marginally to call any two cards. And then if you have, um, if you have an M of five, for example, you fall below. If you have a 27% equity, it's a good call, meaning any two cards, because you're at least 70, 30, basically all the time. Whereas if you have an M of 12 and he pushes, you have to have a 40% chance of calling. Like you can actually fold this and that's good. It gives you more optionality. So the value betting zone is where like you might actually get to see a flop and you have to plan for that. Your hand pre-flop is actually valuable to the extent it hits the flop, not like it is when you have lower M where your hand's gonna be valuable to the extent that you're likely to be winning pre-flop. So this play in 15 to 30 M is very similar to what a cash game play is like. Um, so you're probably gonna see a bunch of flops and we're gonna plan accordingly. You generally don't, you still don't want a flat call pre-flop when you play a hand, you want to be the aggressor. You want to raise when you have a good hand, and you want to fold when you have a bad hand. I'm going to call this flop turn river play, but I really mean it's play when you have enough chips to actually see the flop. What you should do is not play that many hands, but when you play hands, play them aggressively. Um, so the standard bet here is going to be three big blinds plus one big blind for every caller before you. So if, you're the, if everyone folded it before you, you bet three. If two people called before you, you bet five, five times a big blind. Um, all your bets should be big. They should be big, big portions of the pot. Two thirds is an okay number. If you think the person is particularly weak, you can bet the pot. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about pre-flop. When your M is high, your value comes from having a good hand on the flop. I still don't care about the river. You are, you are not, like if you do this right, you're probably not even gonna reach the river by the time someone is all in. We're only worried about the extent that your hand is valuable on the flop. Depending on your position, this is what I'm recommending your opening range is, where I'm saying you're opening by betting, uh, by raising to three big blinds. So I'm saying that if you're in early position, you should really only do this with like the top 5% of hands, which is tens or ace queen, ace queen suited, or ace king. The difference in suitedness actually matters there. So and if you're first to act, any other hand you should fold, um, which is obviously the majority of hands because you have the least amount of information now, like you might be up against someone with another strong hand now, and then on the, every hand, like every card hereafter, you are going to be in the worst position. So like to win in that position, um, 
to be profitable in that position, you need to already have a really good hand. And to the extent that you have the option to just not play a hand, it seems to make sense that you would prefer not playing hands when you're in bad position. So that's why that's a really tight range. When you get to middle position, so maybe like four people to act after you, you can widen up a little bit, which a lot of you might think is still a very tight range, and it is. This might, this might be close to like 15% where you have eights or ace-jack and maybe king-queen. Every other hand, you should be folding. Like, that's your range for raising out of any sort of middle position. And then it makes it easy because you can imagine what type of flop you either hit or don't hit here. So if you're facing a raise, what I recommend is you just move everything up one. So if you're facing a raise in earlier middle position, then you can play tens, ace, queen, ace, queen, ace, king. And if you're late, then you can start playing like ace, jack. Um, so when it comes to the flop, by, by this time you will have um, raised preflop and you are now the aggressor in the hand. Um, so if you were the aggressor, you should bet two thirds of the pot. So that works a lot more often than you would think, even among people who know what a C bet is. And then the break even based on our formula is gonna be two thirds divided by five thirds or 40%. Um, okay, so this is what I'm recommending in terms of tiers. This tier one is a king high flush. Like I'm giving you a little bit of leeway there where you don't need to have literally the ace high flush. But if you have the king high flush, you can go broke for 30 M. In addition, the literal top straight. So if the board is four, five, six, and you have seven, eight, you can consider that tier one. And this is only going to be relevant on an unpaired board. Why? Like, what does a paired board mean? It means a full house is possible. So if a full house is possible, you might not even, it basically makes your hand worse than six more hands that are possible. And like a flush or a straight on a paired board would be considered tiered too. Like if they're betting aggressively into you and you have an ace high flush, you might be ahead, but then if they're raising you, then like I would be very worried about you being up against a full house. So I would bet those much less aggressively. And then like I would only bet the ace high flush here. Like if you have a king high flush on that board, there are all sorts of hands that can beat you. Um, in addition, I'm saying if you have what, like the fourth best flush here, you can bet it, but you can't raise it really. Um, you can't raise it if they raise into you because that just gives um, them too many opportunities to have a hand that would actually beat you. So 10 high flush isn't bad, you shouldn't fold it, and you're not really drawing, but you should understand that it doesn't have four bets of value, it only really has two bets of value. Either a bet and their raise, which you'll call, or if they bet, you can raise them, and that's generally it. And that's obviously on an unpaired board. This also counts as second straight. So a straight where you don't have um, the top two cards, but you have two cards that give you a straight um, that are slightly lower. Um, in addition, bottom set, I, I would put here, in addition to any two pair. So two pair is crushed by a set, and then bottom, like bottom set is also crushed by any set. It has the same problem. So I'm calling this tier two, and I'm saying that's good for like two bets. Tier three is an over pair. So if you have a pair of jacks and the flop comes two, three, four, or something that's a little bit less correlated, like two, three, ten. Like an over pair is good. It's generally considered better. It's it's slightly better than top pair, top kicker because you beat top pair, top kicker. Um, and then top pair, good kicker. I'm saying is also tier three, where you might be able to take it down. Like if you bet and they call, you might still be ahead if they're drawing. But if you bet and they raise, you're probably behind and should treat it like you're drawing thereafter. And then all these hands, which you guys might have previously thought were good hands, are not. They're just gonna be called drawing hands. So top pair, bad kicker. Mid or bottom pair, or a pocket pair that's not an over pair. So if you have fives when the board is two, six, seven. So by the turn of the river, all your turns are gonna be, like they're already gonna be big pots. You don't need to worry about extracting additional bets on the turn. So in general, try to figure out, based on his action, what are the possible groups of hands that he could have here? And in general, like that's it. Like by the time you're on the turn, there aren't like there aren't going to be that many more bets. So like usually on the turn, it's either like go all in or fold. And then hopefully you're going to be in a situation where you played it right previously, where you're going to have a better idea of whether to do that. So bubble play is going to be um, around like 
20% to 10% of the field left. If we're saying that 10% of the field makes money, we're saying that around 10% uh, more is when they're like everyone at every table thinks that, oh, like they have a pretty good chance of making money at some point. So they change around a little bit. This is when ICM starts mattering. This is when like your decisions to win more chips may not necessarily be the maximal decision with regard to winning money. Um, and it's when um, players who are probably not very comfortable with the amount of stakes that they're playing for start to make really big mistakes. So typically, the, the bad players around the bubble will be a little bit too tight. Like they'll, if you're playing in the World Series, they'll see that like, there, are, there are 250 people left and 240 people get 12 grand and everyone else gets zero. And they're going to say, like, OK, maybe I don't need to worry about increasing my chances of getting first place by half a percent if it means that I'm putting myself at risk of getting zero now. Like they, they weigh that little jump in money quite a bit, and as a result, they play a little bit too tight. Um, and then like the general, at least as of a couple years ago, the consensus was that how you do during this bubble period basically determines how deep you're going to go during the tournament. Because this is when the amateurs make the biggest mistakes. Um, so if you're kind of a player who likes to exploit those mistakes, this is when you're going to, like a good player can just crush it. Like he can um, be much more than 50% to double up during this period by just putting, um, identifying weaker players who, who don't want to get knocked out for any reason and just bullying them around. Um, so there are two types of metagame going on now, um, just so you know. So this was a conventional belief. The average amateur player is way too tight. Um, but then once everyone realized that, it became the opposite where, um, the average amateur player was way too, uh, was way too aggressive. Uh, because once the first one gets priced in, then, then everyone starts to be too aggressive because everyone wants to do what good players do on the bubble. So you, you could probably identify your table pretty quickly around this time, whether you see weaker players making really bad calls or really bad folds. Um, that'll uh, kind of give you an idea of what situation you're in. To the extent you can, bully people around. But to the extent that other people are bullying you, um, you don't need to necessarily push them back. Um, let's talk about ICM. So the independent chip model is, is highlighting when the, the chip uh, value diverges from your dollar value in the tournament. So chip EV, which is a C here, how it's different than dollar EV in tournaments. It's related to the chance of you ending up in certain payout spots. That, that's why it's particularly nonlinear. Rather, when the first place gets, gets everything, chip EV equals dollar EV. Because you eventually just have to win all the chips. And like, to the extent it brings you closer to winning all the chips, your, your expectation from the tournament is a little bit higher. Um, but when payouts are steep, it gets a little bit more complicated. Because in some situations, surviving a little bit longer has a material dollar um, difference. And getting more chips in that situation may not be as important as surviving. And we'll go through examples. The, the dollar EV is not symmetric. There, there's curvature. So there, there's two, um, there's this idea of like convexity where um, when, you're, when you win, you always lose in this kind of situation because when you win a lot of chips, those chips go down in value over time. And when you lose chips, those chips are really valuable. So it makes your, your marginal threshold for, for making a risky decision much higher. Like in addition, when you factor in actual utility of money, it's even worse, where clearly big upsides are um, less good than protecting against big downsides. Um, so that's, that's kind of the idea there. Losing hurts more than winning. So let's talk about, let's just go through an example of this, and hopefully this will make it intuitive. Um, so say that we're playing in this situation. It was whatever, like a 100-person tournament that was a uh, $20 buy-in. And we're down to the final four people. And we have 2,500 chips each. And these are the payouts, where first gets a grand, second gets 600, and third gets 400. Um, so what's, if we, if we look at player Adam, like what's his equity? Like what's his expected dollar amount in this tournament, assuming that everyone is approximately equal scale, which is the underlying assumption here? Yeah, it should be like just 25% of the whole pot, because he has 25% of the chips. The whole pot is two grand, so I expect that his EV is um, 500, and it is. So everyone has a 500 EV. But say that we're in a situation where, um, where Adam and David go into a coin flip, and then Adam beats David. So what will Adam's, like intuitively, what do you think Adam's equity should change to? 
Uh, I would imagine it, you would think that he just gets the equity from David because those 2,500 chips are worth $500 in equity in the tournament. But when you run it through, uh, okay, so when this happens, has the equity change? Um, you can run it through Poker Tracker, and I'll go through the, like, the, the kind of rudimentary math for it. You might think that Adam now has 1,000 in EV, and these guys have 500 in EV. And like, really, you should think those guys shouldn't have gained from this happening, because the pot size doesn't change, and they don't even change in chip value. But in actuality, Adam only gains uh, $266 of equity for doubling up here. And these guys actually gain 100 from that happening. Um, so let me, let me show you why that is. Um, so let's look at the deltas of, of, these, of these payouts. So this is worth 400, and then this is worth 200, and this is like getting to first is worth an additional 400. So we originally have $500 of value here. But now that um, one person's out, everyone's guaranteed what? Like, no one, like certainly when someone has zero chips, what's their equity in this tournament? It should be this, right, 400. Like they already are guaranteed $400 of chips. OK, so now that everyone has 400, we're just allocating the remainder of this. We're deciding who gets this remaining 600. So you can see that these guys have a 25% uh, chance of getting that remaining 600, which is why they have like just about 150 more than um, that 400 number. So that's where, that's where it comes from. And the, 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 the reason this is is because the winner does not eventually get all of the equity. Like the winner doesn't end up with 2,000. He ends up with 1,000, which is less valuable than adding up all the equities from every player. Like really, he's giving value out to the second and third place player. Um, so that first spot is probably the worst value when it comes to um, your equity per chip. Because if it, were, if it weren't to take all, then the equity would be flat, and then who would care? But the fact that he's giving money to players who didn't have all the chips in the end caused that first place to be really bad. So since Adam is really close to first place, he's getting hurt the most. You would think he, like, fair value would be 1,000, but he's not. He's well short of it. Whereas these guys are just gaining from it because their most likely place is second and third, and they're capturing some of that value. So a satellite's a tournament that a certain uh, X number of people win a ticket to a bigger event. So the World Series of Poker runs a lot of satellites. And I think these tournaments are great because this is a really difficult situation for people to figure out. And it causes a lot of people to make huge, huge, huge mistakes. Say this is like a 100 person tournament where they all buy in for like $90 or something so, such that first through ninth gets $10,000 and 10th place gets zero. And there are 10 people left. Um, so their equity is just their, per, their percentage chance of winning this flat payout since they all have the same amount, they're splitting that 90,000 pool even, right? So they all have approximately the same equity here because no one gets, gets hurt by having more chips um, by, by the curvature. So say that we're in a situation. Um, blinds are 200, 400, and Irene here, who's in the small blind, uh, raises 2,500 to Jessica, who has kings. This is one person out until we make money. Jessica has kings here. So like, intuitively, what should we do here? Yeah, like calling seems not that bad. So what do we, what, what do I give you here? So king, like what's Jessica's range? Jessica's pushing anything here, right? Because Jessica has an M of like three and she's in the small blind. So she's appropriately pushing any two cards because as we showed earlier, you're definitely, definitely supposed to do that um, at, at least when it comes to chip EV. Um, so Jessica is 82% with the kings and we look at chip equity, she's crushing it. Like, um, she is 18%, sorry, she's 82% to win 5,000, doubling up. She's 18% to lose. Um, so her equity, her expected value after this is um, 4,100, meaning her delta is 1,600. Like she's expected to win 1,600 chips for this. But what about when we look at dollar EV? Well, you see, for dollar EV, she has an 82% chance of winning 10 grand and an 18% chance of getting zero. So her expected value after this call is actually 8,200, which is worse than her equity of this tournament. She actually loses money if she makes this call. In fact, if you put the other person on any two cards, you should even fold aces. Like you should only pretend to look at your cards before you fold this hand. And this is what it is for every, for every person in this situation. Unless you're more than a 90% favorite to win, which you're not because nothing, 
like unless you can particularly put them on a hand which you have a pocket pair that dominates their lower like uncorrelated cards, you should fold. And how should this play out? It doesn't play out like this. Like there's a in the like in Vegas is virtually a hundred percent chance um, Jessica calls here to Irene and Jessica's like dismay, but to the benefit of everyone else at the table. But like what should happen if you're like if you're playing in this situation and everyone's playing rationally, like where, how do you think this will, this will play out at 200, 400 blinds? So Irene would just push her every time? Yeah, so what's your, so if you're, if you're in the big blind and you're pushed into, what's your calling range? Zero. It's zero percent. There are no cards that you should call. And then every single person at that table has that zero percent calling range. However, so knowing that your fold equity is virtually 100%, every single person at the first opportunity should just go all in. Under the gun, every single hand will open push and everyone else will fold. And every single hand, that will happen until the blinds eventually put someone all in against their will. So this is a situation um, where ICM comes into huge play. Like people really screw this up, um, especially live. And that's why satellites are one of my favorite types of tournaments to play is because like every idiot will tell you that that calling with kings here is clearly the right move. Um, when even folding aces is like way, way, way better than calling with anything. Um, so like you should definitely do your best to identify opportunities like this because like to the extent you find a tournament like this that, that ends up in these types of situations, uh, it, it, it's really hard for live players to get this right. Let's jump to late game. So late game, I don't have that much to talk about. Like late game, you, you just have to be, um, so keep steal re-stealing. You're going to be, you're going to have an M less than 10, probably, it, it, unless you like literally just doubled up. Yeah. What is re-stealing? So stealing is, uh, so stealing is when you try to steal the blinds because they're so valuable. Re-stealing is when someone you identify as stealing your blinds and you re-pop them some percentage of the time. It's, it's like protecting your blind. Or, or in some cases, when you see someone steal before you and you're not necessarily a blind, just raising against them. Like, this is all going to be preflop stuff. Um, just be conscious of ICM. Like, maybe it's not a good time to take a coin flip for your life. Like, don't call with ace king here because you have like a 2% edge for a certain range. Um, okay, so that's it for late, late game. I, I really don't find it to be hugely different. Like late game just plays like a ten table sit, uh, a ten handed sit and go. The the biggest difference is that it's as if all the players are playing way above their head because they enter, say, your bankroll for a hundred dollar tournament with a thousand people, and you get down to the last ten. It's now as if you're all playing in a ten thousand dollar tournament. So to some extent, that changes it up, but it, it should generally be treated. Uh, as if it is a sit and go that just um, pays out a little bit flatter. Okay, so let's talk about that's it for tournament play. Um, any questions on that? Uh, otherwise, we can move on to uh, bankroll management. So this is this is really the stuff that's going to be about um, poker as an investment. So so what's a bankroll? So bankroll has a couple different definitions. It, the bankroll is like the amount of money you can devote to to playing poker, making poker investments. However, like I, I think it should be defined as the amount of money that you would have to lose to never play poker again. Like it would have to be not because you're necessarily like ashamed of how much you lost, but because like you lost so much money that the stakes that you would be required to play, um, given like your remaining amount of money, would be so low that you would never make that amount of money back. It's like if you can conceivably put like 20 grand into poker and you lose like $19,900, you're not going to grind out like one cent, two cent games until you have that 20 grand back. You would just stop playing poker. Like you would just be like, okay, you would get, you would get a normal job and rebuild your bankroll through something else. So that, that's how I'm defining bankroll. It's the, the amount of money where poker is no longer a realistic option to be making money for you. So this only matters if you're a winning player. Because if you're a losing player, you should just play, I mean, you should play not at all. You, like, you should figure out how to win, or more accurately, you should move down to stakes that you're actually a winner. But that only matters if you're winning. The, like, the formula for like, your right bankroll doesn't work if you're negative expectation, uh, because you're eventually going to go broke no matter what. So some examples of what this is. For like a new player, you're just going to think of like 
what's a lot of money to you? And then if you lose, if you like, if you're like a new player to poker and you lose 10 grand, you're probably never playing poker again. Like the, like you'll, like you're a huge underdog to ever make that up. So that's probably the end of your poker career if you're, if you're fairly new. If you're an amateur, realistically, you can, I would consider your bankroll like your liquid investments. Like catch that, if you lose, you're not gonna, like you shouldn't mortgage your house, but like a, a couple thousand dollars, like, uh, like a portion of the money you have in the bank, um, that if you lose, you wouldn't um, be homeless seems kind of realistic here. Like the, the amount of money that you're not investing for like the long term, but um, if you lost it and as a result would have to stop playing poker, you would find that to be reasonable. The, the threshold here is like the bankroll management rules are such that you're a 2% chance of ever losing your bankroll. Um, so that's a kind of ballpark for someone who, who's an amateur. A and for pros, it's all of that money plus as much money as they could possibly borrow before they get cut off. Like if you're a Phil Helmuth and you, like he's probably worth like $5 million or something, and he loses $5 million, he's not quitting poker. He's going he's gonna to raise another million dollars and start playing again. So his bankroll is probably like eight before every single person goes like, okay, I'm not loaning you any money. And then he has to get a job at like McDonald's. Like... <laughs> So they're, they're in a, a different situation, and especially when we talk about like, um, like staking, you can have no money and have a bankroll of, of, of a couple hundred grand if you have a track record that's good enough that people will just loan you money. Um, let's go through some, some rules of thumbs uh, for <laughs> bankroll management. So this is the idea. This is the motivation. Someone did the math on this. Um, I remember checking it before. It seemed about right. So we're assuming, so 2% chance to go broke um, based on your average buy-in, and we're assuming you don't change stakes. So this is a really, um, people kind of forget what this assumption is. So if you play, if you change stakes, you're never going to go broke. Why? Because when you lose half your money, you're going to drop down to half the stakes. So like you ask them to near zero, but you'll never, you're never going to actually lose all that money. You're just going to lose a lot until eventually your hourly is not worth it. And when you go up in stakes, it's the opposite. Like your 2%, like say you're, one of the rules is like um, 100 buy-ins. So if you, if you have 100 buy-ins for the main event of the World Series, like you have a million dollars, and then as a result of winning that, you start playing um, 50,000 buy-in tournaments, you're not that still 2% from the beginning to go broke. You are now a new 2%. So like you ha uh, it causes a multiplying factor if, when you win, you take on more risk. And the same way, if you lose and take on less risk, it has a dampening factor. So there's 2% only if you, um, if you don't change stakes. And you really should be changing stakes, especially because there, there's a high correlation between actually losing and not being a good player at whatever stakes you're playing. And it'll give you a chance to identify um, what's the right place for you to play. Um, okay, so that's what the numbers are. I'd recommend, like, I happen to play over, like, over bankroll typically, um, just because, like, I find 2% a little bit too, like, I wouldn't be happy with 2% that I lost all my money, but, like, some people are. I usually prefer, like, I usually, like, double these. You, you should just, if, if you're kind of nervous when you play poker, it's probably, it's either because you're new and you've never done it before, in which case you'll get over it. But if like you actually get hurt by losses to the point where it's like always on your mind, it's probably because you're not really uh, bankrolled appropriately. It's because like if you lost five of those buy-ins, you would stop playing poker, which meant that um, you didn't really have 20 buy-ins worth of bankroll. You only had five. Um, so the theory here is it's based on, do you have a question? Yeah. When you play cash game and say you double, triple your money, should you just you know walk away, or should you just you know because you know you're playing well, you have a bigger stack, you should just keep playing? Like, what's the recommendation? So if they're really bad players, I would you can like so this is based on average buy-in. So basically, if you double your stack and then a lot of players at the table also doubled, you're playing a game that's twice as big. Um, so it's not like that makes it your normal game especially if they're bad. So this is like, the, these numbers go way down if your ROI goes up materially or your win rate. So if you're, if you're winning a game by a lot more than average, you can go with fewer buy-ins. So if you're in a situation where the other players are bad, I would just stay there. If you're in a situation that they're good, I would, as soon as I double up, I would, I would change tables. So table. You can't take money off a table in, in a casino. 
Um, but in general, I wouldn't be too happy about having now like more at risk than my normal uh, risk metrics dictate. Um, so theory here is based on the Keller criterion. So this is, Keller was a big guy in information theory um, some, uh, like a couple of decades ago. Um, his idea is that, say your utility curve is logarithmic, you maximize your utility by betting with regard to your edge. For example, if you're, uh, you're in a one-to-one -one bet where you're 60% to win, you should bet 20% of your bankroll. And he proves it out. You can look up his paper. It's pretty famous. And then it's, he's been getting a lot of flack because this is probably not a great uh, assumption, the logarithmic utility. So this is used um, in blackjack in particular where um, the crux of counting cards is that when the, count, when the count in your favor, you bet more such that eventually you, um, your wins outpace your losses. Um, and then investment management, it's the same idea, where you're going to put more money to what you consider higher alpha generating ideas. Um, and the, the World Series of Poker is an example I find to be really ridiculous because um, it's, it's like the biggest tournament in the world, at least live, 6,000 entries, $10,000, like one of the biggest entries in the world. So the right bankroll is like a million dollars for this tournament. And like given the risk of playing a $10,000, 6,000 person tournament, like you're not getting good returns on your million dollar investment. So it's not really, for someone, I always found this to be a paradox. Like it's for someone who actually plays poker for money, no matter how easy the World Series is, you're not getting good risk adjusted returns, especially when you count overhead. However, the, tor like the World Series of Poker, the average player is really bad still. And you have good upside in that. Um, I think there are a lot of, good outside benefits from um, making big uh, live scores. Like Chris Moneymaker has made way more money as a result of winning the World Series um, and getting these sponsorships than he has from actually winning, I'm sure. And he won, I think, like probably more than a million. It wasn't huge then. Um, but there are a lot of pretty big upsides there. However, like you can do, for this type of tournament, I think it's very common for pros to um, to do some risk management techniques. So one is, is is staking. If like I have an investor that has more than a million dollars, he can allocate this to his portfolio and stake like 10 people and have a little bit more of a diversified investment. So the, the common deal for this, just so you know, um, is them getting 50% of the upside. So they get the first 10 grand at 50% of the remainder and to the extent that it's a long-term staking deal, you don't get money until they get money. So if we play two of these and I lose the first one, they get 20 grand of the, of the second one plus 50% of the remainder. So that's a pretty common staking deal. It, uh, it generally works out. And that was to the extent that you don't need to worry about friction, like trustworthiness, it, it, work, it seems to work out for everyone involved where there's a lot of overhead, but the player is grinding out like a high dollar amount and the investor is getting a good diversification in his portfolio. Um, and it's an equity investment. Like you don't owe this money back if you lose it. They're just um, partnering with you in the tournament. Um, something that's more common recently is selling shares and trading percentages. So this lets them create some sort of syndicate. And I think it's all like handshakes, but it, it, it makes it so that they're pretty diversified. Um, in addition, with regard to outside investors, players will just sell shares of themselves to other um, to other investors. Like they'll they'll cut their like their next 10 tournaments into 10 pieces and they'll try to raise like 15 grand for them where they sell it off in $1,500 pieces. So it lets a relatively small investor diversify across a lot of different players. Um, so this, this makes a lot more sense from a finance standpoint in terms of you're just, you still get this dollar amount, but you're reducing the variance by quite a bit. Okay, so counterparty risk is important, like for staking certainly, like if you stake someone and they like don't play the tournament or like you need to worry about them not paying you back if they win, that's a huge friction. In addition to if you play in like underground card rooms or you play online, like you may not get your money back and you should keep that in mind. Like you're, so if you think it's like you're like the club that you play in is one in 10 to go like get rated during any like night that you play, you should probably reduce your like expected gross winnings by 10% and factor that in. The current poker environment is, um, so online poker uh, started out basically back in 2003 where um, the World Series of Poker started invested a lot of money to uh, build up the publicity. Like they invested in whole card cams and then they really built it up. And then Chris Moneymaker, arguably the worst poker player yet the most charismatic, like won the tournament and he was a great ambassador. And then the following year, someone else who played a 
um, satellite to get in, also one, Raymer, who was a pretty good guy. So poker blew up, and then online po poker blew up, and it was great because mm -hmm. people could just, like your average Joe College student can just load like $500 on poker stars and lose it to me. Um, <laughs> so that was really good for like five years. And then eventually, uh, the natural course of the game is players get better. And then eventually Black Friday happened uh, a couple years back where Full Tilt, one of the poker sites, turned out to be a Ponzi scheme, and they actually, like, they took everyone's money, so anyone who had money on that um, got it confiscated and then possibly got a percentage back, although I'm not sure exactly how that worked. And then all of the poker sites got banned from the U.S. So online's kind of gone, and, like, that was a bit of a nail in the coffin. And then poker has contracted quite a bit. The World Series of Poker used to have, like, you could sit down at a table and there would be like six amateurs, one pro, and two guys reading like poker for dummies. And now it's like 50-50. Like for a $10,000 tournament, it's still pretty soft. But like I played a couple years ago and like I played in a cash game where 10 people at my table were saying that they were professional poker players. I, like probably like a couple were lying, but it, it's much different than it was before. Um, however, if you use good game selection, like if you can find games that are soft, like the side games of the World Series are soft and like low stakes games are always soft. Um, I find it to be something that could add a lot of value um, to uh, an otherwise like good separate career. Mm -hmm. Like it, it diversifies your own investments, especially if you um, if you handle the bankroll stuff properly. And that's it. So thanks a lot, everyone.